Hello and welcome to Building Futures Career Conversations, career conversations with leading lights across the built environment. Today I have with me David Pierpoint, Chief Executive of the Retrofit Academy. Hi David. Hi Gail. So I was really excited for you to come in today because retrofit is the word of the moment when it comes across the built environment. We know about net carbon zero, we know that we have these challenging targets to reach and we know that across the built environment we're contributors to a lot of those carbon emissions but we're also a key part of the solution. So I'm very excited to share your journey but also what you're doing at the moment with everybody but as what I always do I always start with asking people tell me about the journey that you've had and what you've learned along the way to get you to the stage of being chief executive officer. Okay. Um, thank you. It's not been an even, uh, steady rise to success. So it's quite an un mine is quite an unconventional story, I think. Um, but as I reflect, I'm, I'm now doing exactly what I want to do. I'm running my own business. I'm working with my wife. I'm, uh, I've got a team of 30 people who are all brilliant. Um, every day's a, you know, a school day. It's brilliant. Um, so, um, but, but it was not always destined to be that way. Um, and I'm, before coming in today, I was thinking about that, that journey. You don't often sit and think about your story for, for an hour. So I thought about it and um, I went back to when I was a kid and my upbringing was, I had a lot of values sort of, not sort of driven into me. And I've got wonderful parents, but in a, in a right sort of way, I was given a very clear set of values, which I still hold today. Um, you know, I think, I think from my dad's dim and distant past, there was a degree of Methodism, <laughs> even though we're not particularly religious, uh, a work ethic, um, uh, a desire to make a difference to the world. Um, and to, to, to uh, you know, I, I think I was quite a serious child, <laughs> probably far too serious, but I, I knew I wanted to have some form of impact on the world. Um, but like many people, I had no idea how to turn that aspiration into reality and of course I did what all people in those situations do and did a history degree um, and then a history master's degree delaying the inevitable really um, and loved it um, but I think um, there's then uh, there's, a, there's a big theme about right time right place and things happening for a reason yeah. so um, a great example of that was sitting on a wall one day outside a university lecture and my future wife walks past uh, that was definitely a turning point. <laughs> uh, then there was her, because she's far brighter than I am, getting a place on the most prestigious management consultancy training course in the world uh, and moving to London, which from as a, a parochial lad from Stafford um, wasn't necessarily in my life plan, um, but you follow your heart. And um, so I remember going down there and not, uh, not, not being able to get a uh, rent a flat because um, I was still a student in inverted commas. I wasn't, I was looking for a job <laughs> and, uh, and so on and so forth. But you know, there's sort of, that's oh, this is the real world then. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, you suddenly grow up, don't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, then, and then sort of, there's, there's been a number of these sort of uh, right time, right place moments. And one was um, my first job, first, uh, which I fell into was uh, working for, of all places, at the Millennium Dome. Um, and when it was the Millennium Dome, not yeah. the O2. So it was sort of 1998. Uh, and um, I, I mean, I'd been, as usual, as graduates, you'd been to the uh, accountancy uh, <laughs> recruitment things and what have you, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I ended up working in the chief executive's office at the Millennium Dome, um, which was a year, was sort of over two years. So the, the year before it opened, and then the year it was open. And um, the first year I would characterise as being absolutely brutal. Fascinating, but brutal. You know, a very high pressured environment, people under a lot, an awful lot of pressure. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you were coming in in the morning and reading newspaper articles about the people that you're going to see in an office with. Um, and when people are under pressure like that, it's not particularly healthy and their behaviours don't always uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> perhaps do them justice. Um, so it was a really, really tough, but I mean, an incredible induction into the world of work. I mean, you, you didn't, half, didn't half learn a lot, you know, and I, you know, my job involved such uh, delights as making coffee for the board. Well, I was making coffee for Michael Grade and Peter Mandelson and 
Chris Smith and John Prescott. You know, that was that was a dream come true. I'm not making a coffee bit, but meeting people like that was was sort of dream come true stuff. So fascinating, but really, really tough. Um, and then um, and then a second right time, right place moment, I think, was just being in a lift, going from the first floor to the third floor and finding myself in the room with someone who became a real sort of inspirational manager who happened to say that she was looking to take somebody on and would have interest in having a conversation about it. Um, and I was, and, and I did, and I, I needed to change because the environment I was working wasn't very healthy. Um, and, um, and then the, what happened in the year the Dome was open was that all these fantastic people started leaving because they wanted to go off and yeah. um, do the next thing in their lives. And that left lots of opportunity for those of us who were still there. So I went from making coffee to the board to running multi-million pound sponsor-led programs of various sorts. And, um, you know, I was like, well, not necessarily experienced and equipped to do it, but I was trusted by somebody who showed a lot of faith in me and delivered some incredible things. Um, and, um, and that was very purpose-driven. And that purpose-driven thing for me is very important. It's, it, it's, it goes back to that child of wanting to make a difference in the world. Yeah, so, so after the dome, um, which closed, so therefore everyone had to find a new job, um, I found myself working in the world of events, exhibitions and conferences, which um, I loved and loathed in equal measure. Um, I loved it because there was a lot of intellectual challenge around it, you know, think, producing conferences, meeting fascinating people, traveling the world. That was an amazing opportunity. Um, I loathed it for many years because I was working in sectors that didn't necessarily suit my ethical Base. So, yeah. you know, um, I had to find my cause. Um, and after a number of, uh, uh, you know, working in across everywhere from marine electromagnetics to outdoor walking, or walking, uh, uh, and football and all sorts of consumer and B2B markets, I found sustainability in construction. And it was through shows. So um, I, I was offered a job by a big uh, London uh, publishing business, built environment publishing business. They wouldn't tell me what the show was. They would. They 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 said you're the right man to do it. Um, would you mind moving down to London to do this for us? Um, which I did, um, and I'm glad I did. Um, or it was. I'd become a specialist in launching things from scratch, and this was a launch event in sustainability and construction before the uh, credit crunch. Right. So this is quite a long. Can you think about how much we talk about it now? It wasn't talked about as much. It feels like it snowballed well, recently, but that you say so you got in quite oh, early. We, <laughs> um, you say that this is this is at least a third time round. Um, right. So so yeah, this is this is before the credit crunch. Yeah. It was going great guns, um, and the show I organised, you know, was all about the property and construction industry rising to the challenge, and the the, the Blair government then was still very um, big on eco. So, so it felt like its time was very much there. Um, and I'd found, the key thing for me is I'd found my cause, you know, climate change and subsequently fuel poverty, which are two, I'll talk about retrofit later, I'm sure. Um, they, they were the things that got me out of bed in the morning. Um, and, and, and so I sort of poured heart and soul into, into doing that for around about six or seven years. Um, and, um, but I, I didn't want to be an events organiser in my, in my, uh, heart of hearts, I didn't, and um, uh, but then I didn't particularly know what I did want to do. And I'm in my mid thirties by this point with kids, so um, I think I think probably the the key moment for me was um, finding retrofit. So I'd, I'd found sustainability in construction, yeah. and then and then this so the first time around for retrofit was in the early days of the coalition government, so 2010, 11, 12. I know, wow, I was looking at, I remember seeing the numbers. Um, so 27 million homes, uh, you know, 30 years to do it. Um, and we're still talking about exactly the same numbers yeah, now. Was, it was funny, I was, I was going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> it's still quite familiar and yet we've yeah. got less time now. Yeah, yeah, yeah we have. But, um, but I love a challenge. Mm. So, so I was attracted to that. And um, it was a wicked problem that needed a solution. And um, I was headhunted um, to go and run a, a European programme in Stoke-on-Trent which is where I'm from originally. Um, and it was a um, sort of a, they'd retrofitted this derelict pottery works um, and created this place called Core, which was, is a breathtaking place. Um, but, um, 
it was one of those programs that I mean, it, I'd found my, I'd found my calling, um, and I'd found the role. The role was chief executive, and that suits me. I realised I was a leader, <laughs> who knew, <laughs> um, and um, that's what I do well. I do. I, I lead things well, um, and and I'd found retrofit, and um, and then then we realised that to do retrofit, you actually need some people to Absolutely. do it. So um, so I'd been interested in the world of skills and people because I'm. I'm a very positive people, but I'm very positive about people. Um, and um, I'd been on the board of a, a, an organization, a skills organization in the green space and um, sort of was a bit sort of baffled by the way in which the skills establishment went around trying to do things. I thought there must be a better way. And that's what, what, what I tried to do at Core really, it was find an alternative way, a way of making more of a dent in these sorts of numbers than you can, um, than, 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 than doing the normal, because it is, such a massive challenge. Absolutely. It needs disruption. Um, and that's the other thing I worked out I was. I'm a very yes. disruptive individual. <laughs> Some people would call that being very innovative. So, yeah. but it's, it's a fine creative line. thinking, yes. Yeah, it's a fine line. Mm. Um, now, Core um, ran out of money. It ran out of money because the market, so I talk about right time, right, 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 time, right place. There's also um, right place, wrong time. Yeah. Um, and at that point in time, the coalition government, which started off being very pro-green, just put a, oh, I forget if it was the- We hit austerity, I should imagine. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was all, it was, the, it was the cost of living crisis yeah. in 2015, and they just put a red line through just about everything. Um, and a fledging organization like that was, was never gonna be able to survive, and it didn't. Um, uh, now that was, I have to say, that was a very low point. <laughs> you can forget redundancies, that, that, was, that was low because, um, you know, I, I thought I'd, uh, on this very long journey, I'd found my thing, and then uh, and then and then it was gone. So um, I think I had, I'm not sure if it was a midlife crisis or a nervous breakdown. It was one, probably a bit of both. Um, so sort of back end of 2015, um, and then um, and I thought, well, you know, that hasn't worked. I'm a bit sick of working for other people who give me crazy things to do. So maybe maybe I should try this for myself. Maybe I should set up on our own. And for the next few years, so I set up the Retrofit Academy at the beginning of 2016, so a couple of months after, after Core had closed. Um, and for the next two, two and a half years, it was just me, really, uh, in a room trying to push water uphill, still going against the market, still hoping that the market would change and that Retrofit would change. Um, um, as you say, it's all the rage now. It was the complete opposite <laughs> at that point in time. So had to be patient, had to, had to prepare and build. Um, I remember my parents and my wife sort of saying, David, are you sure you want to stick with this? <laughs> really? This has been, yeah. And it was uh, rationally I shouldn't have done um, at that point in time. It had been, it was like being uber patient. <laughs> um, but then in 2018, the worm began to turn. Um, a, a government-sponsored review of the sector said that quality was nowhere near good enough. We needed more investable product. We've got to have quality at the heart of it. And British standards were written, which very much pushed the market in that direction. And so everything that we've been building, all of a sudden there was a market for. Um, and um, and it, I suppose it's gone from strength to strength from there. So I'm getting used to success. It's lovely yeah. when you've not had it for quite a long period of time, you really appreciate it <laughs> and make the most of it. It's, it's also, it's that resilience, isn't it, to keep going and almost this too shall pass, the, the, the good times, this too shall pass, the, the bad times, this too shall pass. It's that being able to cope with actually both because sometimes actually when it goes really well yeah. after it's not gone, sometimes that can feel also quite intense, isn't it, can't it? Oh, well, the intensity never goes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we now run an organisation with 33 people, um, which brings its own challenges. Um, so, you know, you know, but I mean, you, you do whatever, you, I don't think you'll ever find a successful person who's not had failure. In fact, some of the most successful people in the world have had epic failures. Absolutely. The key thing is to learn from them. Um, and, and, you know, to, 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 to find that resilience and find that inner strength to, to, to keep moving forwards. 
So with resilience, there's also a practical side to resilience, which is how do you do I think we all want it, mm. but then there's also what's the mechanism? What are the practical things you do? Are you, if I come to your house, are you meditating at 5 a.m.? Or are you, I don't know, pouring green tea at 3 a.m.? Because that's the time you actually work effectively. What, what, what's been the hack that you've worked through? Okay, there are two, I think, for me. One was I discovered running. Um, right in the pits of the, of the core implosion, should we call it, when core was all going wrong. Um, I realised I went out for a run at lunchtime um, and I worked twice as effectively in the afternoon as I did um, in the hour before lunch. It just re-energised me and I've become a, a complete running addict ever since. Um, ask my wife, oh, you know, I, I'm livable with on a day where I've had a run. <laughs> uh, more, right. more challenging when I haven't. Yes. Um, the other is, and I think I, my dad taught me this, um, more than my MBA taught me it actually, is this thing critical uh, path theory. It's just focusing on the most important things and trying to worry less about the other things. Um, and then trying to get the people around you to, to do much the same thing. They have to do it in their own way. Not everyone's the same, but you know, I tend to, I, I don't know why, I always find it's in threes. There are usually three most important things that you must do on a day, three most important things you must do in a week, and three most important things you must do in a month. And as long as you can tick those off, broadly speaking, you'll be fine. So, so keep it as simple as you possibly can. That is easy to say, it's harder to do, but um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit old fashioned. It's, it's a, a scribble down in my notebook. I'm a, I'm a big, you know, recorder and noter and. And, and um, but also ticker offer. Are you, are you no, no, or no, is it just writing no, them that I'm, helps it? No, I am, I am not, uh, I'm not a hugely organized person. In fact, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an entrepreneur. That's what I discovered at some point along the line. That's what I discovered I am. I just happen to be. I suppose more of a social entrepreneur than a, an out and out Branson type entrepreneur. Um, and I, I don't like being limited by lists. I don't want, I'm not a process person. In fact, the last thing I am is a process person. But when you have a, I suppose, a creative brain uh, and you're a solution finder and a, it sounds horrible, isn't it? A big thinker, I suppose, big blue, blue sky, big picture thinker you do have to have some degree of structure and, 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 and that is the degree to what I want to go to. So um, it's that list of three. I don't need to go any further than that. I surround myself by peop other people. This is a definite career hat for leaders. Surround yourself by people who are brilliant organisers <laughs> and brilliant at getting you organised. But I think what you are, what I'm hearing is, you're incredibly self-aware. Okay. And I wonder if the reason that you're so successful is you, you're self-aware of where you're strong and you're self-aware of where you need support from others. Yeah, yeah. And you, it sounds to me like, quite methodically, you've then sought in other people the bits that you need help in. But you can't do that unless you're self-aware enough or you even accept that you're not good at certain parts. <laughs> yeah, I think self-awareness is, is absolutely fundamental. I it's not something I'd ever thought about until I did a leadership programme. Um, a year-long thing. It was in the days where big companies could afford to do this kind of thing. You know, they sent us pa to Sao Paulo for a week to work on the favelas. It was it was amazing. And they also did a huge amount of self-awareness stuff. So you know, Myers Briggs type things. Um, and the reason that I am, <laughs> I am. I mean, I always I do this with all my team. It's, they'll, they'll if they if they watch or listen to this, they'll they'll. Oh, we, um, we do it all the time. When I first did my Myers Briggs profile, I got it wrong. Got it wrong by one letter, and it, for those of you who know it, it's the sort of INTP, ENTP, four-letter thing. And I came out as an I, rather than an E, which is introvert rather than extrovert. Um, and the reality is, I'm right on the border between. It's one question difference between the two, but the difference between an INTP and an ENTP is night and day, right? And I spent the whole of this year working with this this group of people who were trying to manage me as an INTP, and it felt so wrong. That's not me. I'm not cold. I'm not. I'm not remote. Why are you talk to me as if I? And um, <laughs> and then I read the ENTP profile. I thought that's me. And all of a sudden, it all clicked into place. Mm -hmm. To the extent, I mean, you get you get these sort of free profiles, don't you, about yeah. what that means for you? Uh, to the extent that um, you know, it sort of said, as an ENTP, you're likely to take a long time to find what you're put on this earth to do. <laughs> and I thought, ah, yeah. That, that, That'll be it. But, um. but it's interesting, though, because um, 
I found that some of the, the most successful people that I've been privileged enough to spend time with haven't said, oh, yes, oh, I knew, you know, at the age of 10, this is what I wanted to be. Okay. And especially across the built environment, it would appear actually a lot of them, it has been a journey. And not necessarily, as you said, one that's been linear and yeah. has been, it's all been about success. Mm -hmm. And that ability to continuously learn about themselves. Yeah. Um, so can we circle back to, you talked about the MBA, because yeah. I know there'll be people listening to this who, do you feel that it really helped you, who may be considering doing it? Do you feel that it's something that really helped you? Or do you look back and go, actually, I probably reinforced everything I already knew? No, no, not at all. So uh, I did that when I was 25. Um, and I'd spent four years in the university studying history. And then, what, three, four years out in the world of work. And I didn't have a clue about, the, you know, about marketing. I mean, I, you know, about, about, about business. So, no, I needed, I did need that education. Um, and but again, the self awareness thing comes into it. You know, there were there are aspects of that which, you know, the the financial management, the corporate. I, it's not me, uh, and I didn't know that going into it. I came out of it knowing I seemed to excel in anything to do with strategy, and I loved it. Mm. <laughs> so I remember. I mean, there was another these sort of right time, right place moments. I was offered a, the opportunity to stay on studying at Aston University, and I'd given a presentation. And one of the professors said, stay on, do a PhD, you know, in, and, and, and I, I sort of still kick myself sometimes that I said no to that because I think I would have loved it. And may, I think at some point in my life, I will go back. There's to, still time. I think I, think I probably always, will yeah. at some point. But um, yeah, I know, I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was a transformational experience for me. Um, I know other people who've done them and they've just hated every second and it's just been and they've seen it as unnecessary and and so it's not for everyone um i was yeah. lucky I, I took a year out studied full-time threw myself into it was determined to take a big step forward in my career and that was the catalyst for it so it changed the way i thought which is really good and then can we also talk about set it your own business because i know there's lots of people in their careers particularly across the built environment where they may be working for a big consultancy maybe a big government body maybe they're working for a big contractor that that have this sort of almost daydream of you know could i be doing this for myself and i've spoken to so many people in my own career who have have sort of been having almost those those kind of thoughts in their own head and i think for anyone listening who has felt that way how did you find kind of setting up your own business and taking that career move to do, be, become your own employer as opposed to working for somebody else? Okay, um, very liberating. Um, but, but I hope the difference between me and some of the people you're talking about might be listening today is I hadn't necessarily had very good employers. Right. Um, and I'd had a number of thankless tasks. Um, so, and that's why I ended up, I don't think I was born to be, necessarily born to be an entrepreneur. I think I did it because I was really fed up of, try of people asking me to do the impossible or succeed and yet fail, that sort of thing. Um, and I hope not everyone has that experience. Um, they don't by any manner of means. So the other thing I'd say is, is you've got to pick your moment. Um, so if you want to avoid the four years worth of pushing water uphill that I had, you know, that, that was because I was waiting for the right time. And I knew, I sort of knew that that time was very likely to come. Albeit there were times where you're clinging on by your fingernails to that hope and expectation. So, so but if you, if you do think it's right for you, and if you, if you can see the opportunity and the time is right, then absolutely go for it. Um, but if it's, if, if the market isn't there, if the opportunity is not really there, you know, failure, it, it, you know, you, you're taking risks with your own money, you're taking risks with your own livelihood. So you've got to really balance that uh, risk and reward. I think that's really measured. That's a really good piece of advice because I think it's something that I know we haven't covered yet. And so far in the times I've spent interviewing other people. So I think people listening to that would, would like that knowledge. So coming back to, to retrofit itself. So the purpose of the Retrofit Academy is to help to train up people in an area that you know, unless you know how to do it, you don't know how to do it. What, for you, what do you see as the next 10 years of retrofit? What needs to happen 
in order for us to hit these very large targets, as we've both discussed, that have existed for some time, and yet we don't are not making as fast progress as some people might wish. Yeah, yeah. No, so 27 million homes um, now. Uh, what have we got left? Six and a half years to hit our interim target in 2030, and and 20. Six years to hit net zero. So yeah, I mean it's it's it's. it's I mean look, I, we have um, again, come come back, come back to, to to yourself and your values. You have to. So I I, def, I tried to distill the, those values into four keywords: positive, ethical, empowering, and practical. And they've become our corporate values. And the reason I'm saying that is the practical one. We could be daunted, intimidated by those numbers. So here's another one for you. We think that to um, deliver the decarbonisation of our housing stock, we need 420,000 new people. Whoa. Yep. Okay. In the middle of a skills shortage where yeah. we've got very low levels of unemployment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the, the normal sort of business as usual response to that would be to talk about the fact that that's a really big problem. Um, what we try and do is get really practical about it. So um, there is now... A, a number of government-funded schemes, um, particularly into the world of social housing and funding through local authorities, which are trying to do retrofit well, which is really important. We have to do retrofit well. We don't want to do retrofit badly, otherwise we'll be doing it all over again. Or we'll be making people's lives really horrendous if we do. So um, there is a big movement, and there are now billions of pounds flowing into that, which is new. That's never happened before. Um, so that's, a, that's, a, that's the moment. This is the moment. Um, what we do is look at all those projects that are taking place and, and say, well, what, what skills resources do they need? We work with all the key employers and the key local authorities and social landlords, and we're defining the skills gaps that they have and, and trying to meet those. So London, for example, has a lot of solid brick property. A lot of, that means a lot of them need external wall insulation applying to it. We've got a fraction of the number of external wall insulators that we need in London. No one's focused in that and trying to solve that practical problem. So, so we are. <laughs> um, so, so you know that. And there's lots of things, <laughs> huge interconnected global uh, uh, level things that need to happen for retrofit to happen. The bit that we're there to solve is the workforce to deliver that. Um, and um, and I think. You know, I think because we're so clear, our mission statement's another scary number. It's a, but our mission statement is to is to um, drive the development of two hundred thousand competent retrofitters by the end of the decade. Um, we've done five thousand, um, so we're still in the footholds, but that's five thousand from scratch, um, and we're now training. Uh, as well as individuals, we're training colleges and universities and all sorts of other providers about how to train retrofitters too to scale up the the level of delivery. So um, that's the kind of stuff. And it, and it and it gives you when you go back to what you were saying right at the start in terms of your own career. Does that give you because you have that strong sense of purpose? You must also get that real feeling of wow, we're actually doing this. I'm actually making a difference. Do you feel yeah, that uh, every day? Right, every day. Um, and um, I mean, it, there are, um, I'm probably staring in the face several very, very large business opportunities that I could do, and I don't do them. Um, I actually support other people to do some of them, um, not, not because I'm being selfless, simply because that's my life's work, yeah. and that's what I want my life's work to be. And not only that, it's now my wife's life work because she joined uh, a few years ago, and we're both as invested in it in that mission we're very driven by the mission now it doesn't mean you have to wear a hair shirt it doesn't mean that you can't have a great lifestyle around it um we're still learning how to balance work and, and everything else but I think everybody um, is yeah. <laughs> yeah sounds very normal yeah um but um yeah no it's i mean that, that it is a retrofit is a it's a world of opportunity um, it's going to be a very very fast growing market there's room for lots of people to do lots and lots of different things um, and um, and it's great fun. Whilst whilst we've got that sort of current flowing behind the whole thing, um, you know, there's a real energy. There's some amazing people involved in the sector, um, particularly in the world of social housing and the contractors around that. There's, there's a brilliant. Again, there are a lot of those people are purpose and mission driven too, um, and are very passionate about 
the two of the great evils of, 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 of the scourges of society, solving climate change, tackling climate change and, and eradicating fuel poverty. If those don't get you out of bed in the morning, you're in the wrong job. <laughs> so if, if you um, could say to the rest of the built environments, those big contractors, big consultancies that are trying to solve this, what piece of advice, if you could just say one thing to them, this is what you need to do, what could you say to them? Because we have to deliver this together, don't we? We do, we do. So um, there's a sort of a, there's a tendency to panic that we're not doing enough quickly enough. And the reason for that is we're still learning. And, and, and when we've learned how to do retrofit really, really well, on a, at a small scale, we then need to learn how to do a retrofit really, really well at a big scale. And that is, no one's ever done it before. It's never happened. You know, no society has ever decarbonized before. No one has ever decarbonized the housing stock. Um, and when we have tried to do these things in the past, it, a lot of it has had some really bad unintended consequences that put a lot of people off because they think, well, I get this wrong, then we're at risk or you know, we're going to get sued or what have you. So there's nervousness around it. It's still baby steps. It's still learning. Um, there is a very collaborative, even amongst the contractors, there's a very collaborative ethos. Great. Thank um, goodness as yeah. well. You know, as a, someone yeah. invested in this, just as, as a citizen of society, great. Great that everyone's working together. But also, that there's plenty of funding and cash and yeah. opportunities to go around. So yeah, that is the attitude and that is that is really exhilarating to be part of. Long may it continue. So David, what I've been hearing is this purpose that has driven you all the way through. And it sounds like it came from such a, an amazing family upbringing that gave you that purpose. And it's something that's clearly threaded through all of your career, but at the same time, there's a practical side, a real deep practical side of, I want to be on this mission. It really drives me, it gives me energy. But there's a deep practical side to how you bring this to life. And a real, you have, it's quite amazing for someone who's got that positive, almost idealistic outlook, but yet couples this with this incredible, and this is practically how you bring it to life. And certainly for me, what I've learned a lot about, first of all, is the answer to the question that a lot of people I know when I talk to them about their careers, about when they say, oh, should I set up my own consultancy or whatever it might be, small contract or whatever. I think you've given some really practical advice on that. But I think you've also given some practical advice on how you yourself have kept yourself resilient so that you can continue to go forward with your purpose. And I think that's such a brilliant skill set that you've had. And thank you so much for sharing that with us, because certainly I feel that I've learned a lot. And, and I hope that you've also felt that you've learned a lot today. Please tune in for future podcasts and video series on the Hayes channel, on LinkedIn, YouTube. You can follow us also on Spotify and Apple.